fur trade to grain handling. Historically, this is the place where East met West. Here, on the north shore of Lake Superior, this was once known as the rendezvous place. And I suppose by stretching the imagination, you could say that led to the marriage of Port Arthur and Port William to become the city of Thunder Bay. That was a kind of strange marriage because those two cities so fiercely rivaled each other that when Rudyard Kipling came here in the early 1900s, he said they hated each other with a pure, poisonous, passionate hatred that makes cities grow. The lore and the legend, and some just plain truth about the city of Thunder Bay on this issue of Sketches of Our Town. Nana Bijou, the sleeping giant. Surreal in the light of dawn, the rock which symbolizes the spirit of the deep sea water, speaks of the Ojibwe mythical giant turned to stone for revealing the secret of a cache of hidden silver. Its presence pervades the shoreline of Thunder Bay and is a keystone to the story of the region. The urban center, containing a population of 120,000, is the world's largest grain handling port. Like a board game, its city streets create a distinct pattern which reveal the community's historical makeup. When traced, the pattern delineates Thunder Bay's growth, leaving one with a more thorough appreciation of the city of today. Such was the Northwest Company in its powerful and prosperous days when it held a kind of feudal sway over a vast domain of lakes and forest. Near its original site on the Kaministiqua River is a reconstruction of what was the most important settlement in the interior of North America, Fort William. Built in the early 1800s by a partnership of Montreal financiers, this was the seat of a fur trade empire the nucleus of North Shore settlement, after American independence forced a move from its previous headquarters. Jean Morrison. When the Northwest Company decided to move from Grand Portage up here, they employed several hundred workers to come up and build this. This was a grand edifice, and it was planned as a typical fort. I compare the palisade that you can see to a uh, security fence that you might see around any major industrial complex. Um, it was just to safeguard the property from people who uh, might want to grab some of the goods that were here. Bearing the name of the company's chief superintendent, William McGilvery, the site was the hub for commodity exchange in a territory which encompassed thousands of square miles. This is one of the reasons Fort William was so important, because you couldn't get your furs from Athabasca and farther down to Montreal and 
in one canoe trip and then get the trade goods back, you had to have a halfway point. And so Fort William was developed as this halfway point. So the canoes from the west would only come this far and the canoes from Montreal would only come this far and then they would exchange their cargoes. Storage buildings like these, set on pillars to prevent damage by vermin and moisture, were filled to capacity each season. Volume of trade was at its peak between 1805 and 1808, when the harvest of 824,000 pelts of beaver, muskrat, fox, and marten was traded. For three out of four seasons, the facility was managed by about a dozen people. They would prepare for an onslaught of arrivals that would swell the population to as many as 2,000 adventurers. The summer rendezvous was a get-together that defied description. Barely would the ice be out of the bay when the Lachine Brigades would arrive, ending their tough 50-day trip, powered by the muscle of the voyageurs called Manjou de la, the pork eaters. Soon they'd be joined by the Iveno, the winterers, who would come down from the north and the west in their smaller canoes. This big blowout, and a blowout it was, needless to say, was the main topic of conversation until they'd meet again the following year. So there are stories of great rivalries, fights, brawls, a lot of drinking. These guys had worked really hard with uh, not only paddling, you have to remember all the portages they'd endured, and carrying 90-pound uh, packs. Now, most of the people wouldn't live inside the palisade. These voyageurs who came, there were two kinds of voyageurs, the Montrealers, and they lived at the east side of the palisade, and the northerners lived on the other side. And they, most of them slept just under their overturned canoes. A few of them who had money would have a little tent. Uh, the only voyageurs who lived inside the palisade were the guides. These guides were in charge of a brigade of canoes, maybe three canoes, up to 10, perhaps. Furs destined for insatiable European markets spelled competition and bonanza. Major shareholders who came to rank among the nation's wealthiest men enjoyed a baronial wilderness experience. Making aggressive inroads into the trade, the Northwesters soon met the wrath of the Hudson Bay Company, whose monopoly was being undone. Politics played heavy, as the Bay Company complained that furs meant for them were being intercepted by these peddlers from Quebec, often as thick as mosquitoes. The subsequent trade war became a battle of unprecedented proportions, leaving a widespread aftermath of social, economic, and personal tragedy. This is not amalgamation, it is submersion. We are drowned men, wrote one partner when it was apparent that a merger with the Hudson Bay Company was the only viable alternative. The 1821 rendezvous at Fort William was the last. Replaced as the inland headquarters, the site would fade from prominence and the song of the canoe brigades would be heard no more. And so ended an era, one never to be forgotten in the chronicles of Canadian history. The Great Hall. Of this site, Washington Irving, some 15 years later, poignantly wrote, the feudal state of Fort William is at an end. Its banquet hall no longer echoes to the bursts of loyalty or the old world ditty. The lords of lakes and forests have passed away and the hospitable magnets of Montreal. Where are they? It's quite a story. The grip of the down cycle on the region would hold fast for decades until the dawning of a new day. 
yet to unfold in the North Shore story would be the era of these castles of commerce, the steel rail line, and the hidden treasures of Nanabiju. The western terminus of the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Seaway, Thunder Bay today shares its natural deep water harbor with pleasure craft. On the commercial side, 1,500 ships carrying 23 million tons of grain will sail from here in one season. In Roly Zegenfuss's tug, we toured the area where the original Fort William stood. The landmark Jackknife Bridge, the grain elevators, described once as looking like the great keep of a Norman fortress. The 1800s were a time of speculation, and new interests were sparked by mineral finds to the south. By the mid-century, prospectors began staking this region. Primarily, they were looking for copper. They would get their big payoff, but not in the form they expected. The eyes of the entire continent would focus on a mother load discovered on a tiny outcropping of rock that wasn't much bigger than this tugboat. Out there, beyond the sleeping giant. On July 10, 1868, a four-man survey crew from the Montreal Mining Company, under the supervision of Thomas McFarlane, landed here, then called the Woods Location. Author Eleanor Barr describes their find. So the, one of the men looked down, and he saw this vein. It was white, and it had black specks in it. It was silver. And he was very excited. And they, they did a blast. They blasted some of it out. The one man ran to the shore. And he looked down, and what did he see? A bigger vein than the one they were blasting, right there at the waterline. And they could see the vein just ran into the lake and joined with the other one, and that was it. That must have been just so, such an exciting day. Shania, Ojibwe for silver. The secret of the sleeping giant was revealed. Canada's first silver mine was also the most improbable. Against all odds, at times wading waist deep into the lake and later using coal-powered water pumps, workers defied the icy waters of the world's largest freshwater lake to burrow deep into her bedrock, hauling out ton after ton of precious ore. The first thing that crew really had to build was a breakwater. You had to keep the waves from washing over that little island. They made cribs, blasted rock, set the rocks in the cribs. They had to enlarge the island. It must have been such a heartbreak, because every time they'd build one, a storm would come up and break it down, and they would have to build it again. And this happened several times. 1870 to 75 saw $50 shares soar to 25,000. In one year, 30 men earning $2 a day harvested $1.2 million worth of silver. Silver Island Mine was the new El Dorado. When it finished, they had a, two shaft houses, a big engine house, the four boarding houses, the rock house, the assay office. They had a blacksmith shop. At that time, the uh, mine was a quarter of a mile deep. Only a glimpse remains of the era where uncompromising determination made fortunes. This is Silver Island Landing, the mining village on the nearby mainland that once housed supply stores and where the residences for married employees and the company hierarchy were built. Buildings like these continue to pay tribute to that heyday. At its peak, this location was the most important harbor along the North Shore, taking over where Fort William had left off. The latter, however, did play a key role as the initial supply base for the surveyors and prospectors. Within a dozen years of the excitement hitting the area, falling prices in a world economic depression and dwindling production painted a bleak future. In March of 1884, when a delivery of coal necessary to keep the water pumps running 
failed to arrive, silence gripped the site. The lake gradually reclaimed that which was hers. It is said that at times, echoing off Thunder Cape, the groan and creak of the water pumps can still be heard. Components of history, Old Fort William, Silver Islet, each had its moment in the unfolding story. But the strongest asset that would ensure a future here was the strategic location of the lakehead as the gateway to the west. Tori Tronrut, historian. Fort William at this time, say in the late 1860s, the early 1870s, was uh, just the remnants of a fur trading post. Uh, there weren't a great many people here. Port Arthur uh, began as a, as a, uh, a work site for the road, the Dawson Road or the Red River Road, which was to link the lakehead with Winnipeg. The Dawson Road was named after Simon J. Dawson, who was uh, an engineer um, considered by some to be the, the father of Port Arthur, seeing as he was uh, instrumental in, in creating a community here. He built the Red River Road primarily to provide a Canadian route for the settlement of Western Canada. There was considerable concern that um, the west of Canada would become part of the United States. And the urge was to provide an all-Canadian route. The idea was increasingly more plausible. The opening in 1855 of the locks at Sault Ste. Marie had provided upper lake access by steamer. The inaugural run of regular service from Collingwood, which terminated at the foot of the Red River Road, and the uprising in Manitoba created a new wave of activity. It received a great deal of impetus from the First Real Rebellion in 1870 because the government had to rush troops uh, out west, and uh, they called upon uh, Garnet Wolseley to, uh, to lead his troops through Thunder Bay, and he was supposed to take the Dawson Trail, the Dawson Road. When he got here, he found that the road was scarcely built. There was only about 16 miles of it built, and that leaves a lot of way to go to Winnipeg. And uh, his troops, he had about 1,000 troops, and they spent a lot of time building more miles onto the road, and eventually it reached the point where he simply abandoned that, and he took the old fur trade route west, uh, following up the Kaministiqua River. Prince Arthur's Landing, after Queen Victoria's 19-year-old son, was the original name given by Wolseley to the burgeoning community. Later changed to Port Arthur as the harbor gained status, the cluster of shanties was almost overwhelmed with watering holes whose doors swung open to quench the thirst of the majority male population. I believe at its maximum, Port Arthur in the 1880s, which was the period of the boom, had about 5,000 people. And there was, I believe, more than one bar for every 10 people. The dream of a rail line was the topic of conversation when Sir Sanford Fleming arrived aboard the side wheeler Francis Smith in July 1872. Fleming had come to scout a route for a transcontinental railway. A key link was to connect Winnipeg to the lakehead, opening a western transportation corridor. Fort William or Port Arthur? Where would the first locomotive arrive? Where would the rail terminus land? Speculation fertilized seeds of discontent. And there grew up in Thunder Bay a notion which makes no sense to us today, but it certainly uh, it was predominant in those days, that only one community could survive at the lakehead. Even though they're only a couple of miles apart, only one of them would survive. Uh, so when Fort William in 1875 got the, the terminus of the, uh, what was to become the CPR, Port Arthur felt that it was all part of a grand conspiracy to, um, to destroy Port Arthur. And from this, there developed uh, a constant rivalry. Every sporting event, uh, every industry that came here, even in the field of the arts, uh, and also, in particular, railways. It, it got to the point where it was actually quite ridiculous. At one point in the early part of the 20th century, the two cities were on in different time zones. 
One adopted daylight savings time and the other one, just despite them, uh, refused to. Fort William at one time uh, gleefully let the world's press know that Port Arthur was suffering a smallpox epidemic. That in, in the 1890s, without realizing that uh, they were only a few miles from it. <laughs> Fort William became a vital link in grain shipment, the waterfront becoming a wall of towering elevators, a pantry for Great Britain. Knowing that the crossover of directors between the railway and the Hudson Bay Company, who owned the lands, played a good part in the railway's decision, Port Arthur felt disadvantaged. It saw that the, the Fort William had the CPR terminus, and a lot of the railway workers lived in Fort William. It wanted to tap into that. It wanted some of those railway workers to live in Port Arthur and commute to Fort William. So it decided it would build a street railway. And that was fine as far as Port Arthur was concerned, but uh, they wanted to build it right through Fort William as well. So that led to a great deal of animosity. The, the Ontario legislature eventually uh, uh, ordered Fort William to, uh, to open its doors to this Port Arthur built railway. Eventually, Port Arthur also won the Canadian Northern Rail. It chose the foot of the Red River Road for its terminus. By this century, balance at last. The two communities had prosperity at their door. Thunder Bay, old rivals, Fort William and Fort Arthur, united since the 1970s as one family. The diversity of the population today reflects the impact of its historic role as a connecting link to the West. There are family names which also go back to the beginning. Furs, mining, forestry, transportation, and entrepreneurship. Resilient through time, silent and still legendary, is Nana Bijou, the rock they call the sleeping giant. Whenever I go, whenever I do that place, I know it'll always be home.